Okay, so yesterday we started talking about archaeology. We very, very loosely defined it as studying really old stuff. We're going to get a much better definition of that today, what it actually is. But that was a good starting point, studying really old stuff. This is a picture of some people practicing archaeology or studying archaeology. So these are people that you would term as archaeologists, people that practice or study archaeology. I want you to look at this picture for a minute and tell me just anything that you notice about it, anything that you notice about the work that they're doing or maybe what they're trying to do, maybe something about what they're using, anything at all. Yeah, call it. Cool. They're uncovering artifacts and they're really carefully taking them out. Can you tell me a little bit more about that word you used, artifact? It's a really good word. Um, what is that? It's like, it's like a relic, an old historical item. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's enough. It's an item. It's a thing. Um, artifact sounds like a really fancy word, but really it just means a thing that you found. Okay. That thing needs to be left behind by people or a group of people would it truly be called an artifact. And there's different types of artifacts. We'll get to all that stuff next week. But for now, that's good. An artifact is something that you find. So these archaeologists have found something, an artifact. And like Calder said, they're very carefully removing it from the dirt that is around it. Okay? What is this archaeologist using to remove the dirt? A paintbrush, right? A lot of archaeologists' tools are pretty simple. Uh, and a lot of them are adapted from other tools. You'll see some more in just a second. So she's using a paintbrush because a paintbrush has some good qualities for what an archaeologist wants to do. An archaeologist is going to want to remove dirt, dust, and debris from the artifacts they find, but they're also going to want to do that gently, and the bristles of a paintbrush can serve both of those purposes. You can remove dirt, dust, and grime, but you're not going to like scratch the thing that you're looking for. So she's very carefully removing the dirt. And like Calder said, we can make an inference. This pot is probably going to get fully removed from where it was found. Good. Um, other things that we notice. Say that again. There's two other artifacts in the background. Okay. We can find some other stuff that perhaps they're unearthing. Where do you see some other artifacts? Okay, in the dirt by him? Yeah. Okay. Looks like there's something there. One behind her foot, kind of, sticking out of the ground. Behind whose foot? Uh, the lady that's brushing off the thing, but it's like back more. Like oh, okay. Cool, I see it. My screen is a little different than yours, so it was cut off when you were telling me. Good, so there are other artifacts, not just the central one that we can see maybe the most uh, easily. Cool. Uh, what else? do we notice about what they're doing or their tools or anything else? Yeah, call her. Um, well, again, it looks like they have like this zone dig site rectangle and then they have like this Okay. That's a good thing to notice. Yeah, and you've noticed a couple of things. You've noticed that it's uh, very precise. We have pretty clean edges of the shape that we can see where they've been digging down. Um, that's because archaeologists need to be very careful when they remove the dirt, not only to make sure the artifacts stay intact, but to make sure that they don't get confused later about where they found something. They couldn't just go into a field and dig up as much as they can and find as much stuff as they can. That might be a cool thing to do on the weekend, but if you're an archaeologist that needs to maybe go back to those things that you found years in the future and ask some more questions about them, you want to know exactly where you found that thing. So one of the first steps that archaeologists do, which this group has gone well past this, is just plot out like a checkerboard or a chessboard on top of the earth and then keep those sections separate from each other when they're finding items in those sections of dirt. And so that way they have this grid where they can create a formula that tells them exactly where every item was found. And even if they are going to remove it and take it back to the lab and run tests on it, they still know exactly where it was before they removed it. This leads to another question for you guys to think about is why are old things underground? 
If you imagine however many hundreds or maybe thousands of years ago that pot was used, at some point it was left there on the ground. Why didn't it just stay on the ground? How is it what looks like maybe six feet underground if you judge it by those people standing in the background? How can we make sense of that, Giuseppe? Uh, because there's a lot of stuff. It could be mudslides and volcanoes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. So sometimes nature will do something pretty quickly to bury something, like a mudslide or a volcano. Sure. How else can things get buried? Yeah, Dylan. Just by, you know, um, most civilizations or settlements are by riverbeds, and riverbeds are usually in valleys, so stuff, you know, just... You know, can shift, can move. Um, erosion. Sure, yeah. So you've got erosion, too, which is a, a good thing for moving soil taking soil from one place to another. Yeah. Sometimes uh, artifacts are buried with people. Yeah, sometimes the people do the burying on purpose. And uh, probably next week we'll watch a video and talk about how do archeologists tell if something was buried or not, which seems like it would be a really hard thing to tell since all of these things are buried. How can you tell if humans buried it or not? But uh, the video and I will both talk about a trick that they use to tell if something has been buried or if it was buried by nature. Um, any other reasons for why these things are underground? Besides people burying them, mudslides, volcanoes, uh, maybe erosion happened next to a river. Yeah. I was about to say just like natural erosion. Yeah. Yeah, natural erosion using wind and water is shifting dirt all over the place. And another really big one is a lot of living things on our earth die and then turn into soil with the help of bacteria and fungus. So a tree falls in the forest, over time, a bunch of fungus, a bunch of little bugs, a bunch of bacteria are gonna eat up that tree and turn it into new soil. And that new soil is gonna rest on top of the old soil. This is something that happens on earth that's hard for us to notice because it happens so slowly. In our lifetime, Wyman Woods is gonna look pretty much the same, even the big hill. It's gonna look about the same. But if we were able to visit it in another 500 or 800 or 1200 years, it's probably gonna look a little bit different because earth soil is always getting added to and earth soil is always shifting and getting deeper and more pressure and we have uh, a lot of heat and pressure down at the bottom of our crust that eventually turns into core anyway we keep adding more and more soil to our earth and our crust is kind of like a pot of boiling water they, there are uh, shifting going on all the time so artifacts get buried very slowly Something that's neat about that is if you find a whole bunch of artifacts and you're able to date them, you can start to hypothesize how deep something is going to be at a certain time. So you can say things like, well, in the area around London, England, if you're looking for things from the 1200s, you're gonna have to dig about this deep. So it's, it's pretty neat that they can figure out where to expect to find stuff just based off of time and that idea of constant erosion and, and things getting buried. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, next picture. Did we start to look at this one yesterday? Yeah. Okay. So we probably talked, did we talk about what these tools were? Okay. So we had this ruler, we had this plumb bob. This has to do with what we were just talking about a minute ago about how they need to plot everything out and be very meticulous, take their time and be very detailed about where they are looking and way that, where they are finding these items, okay? Next thing we'll look at. This is an old tool, okay? I want you guys to look at it for a minute and then come up with some ideas of what it might be, but then also think to yourself how, if I was an archeologist and I found this and I thought it was a such and such, what could I do or what questions could I ask to find out if I'm right, or at least to try to find support that possibly I'm right, okay? So what do you think it might be, and then what might you do to find out if you're right, or if you might be right? Yeah, Jack. Um, like a hoe or something? Okay, looks like a, a hoe, a garden tool, something to move dirt around. Do you have an idea of what you might do to test or ask a question to find out if you're right or not? Um, research. Okay. So you could try to find maybe someone else has found something similar and wrote about it or something like that, okay. What else could you do 
to see if this is really used in the garden. Yeah. Yeah, try to do it. That's a big thing that archaeologists do. Now, usually they won't use the actual artifact because usually it's really old and fragile and they don't want to break it. But what they'll do is they'll make a replica. They'll use the same materials. They'll try to make it as close to that thing as they can. And then they'll go out in the field and actually do it and see if it works. Now, if it works, that doesn't prove that that's what this was, but it just supports it really well. That, you know, we, we made one of these ourselves. We took it out in the garden. We used it to move the dirt. It worked really well. So maybe that's what it was. Good. Uh, what else might it be? And how else might you try to find out if you're right or not? Yeah. Make, um, press, or com compress something, or... Okay. There's, there's holes on it. Okay, so we have these, like, tines on this end, these pokies. Maybe this is used to squish something, to compress something. Any ideas for what you might do to see if you might be right? Do, that. do the same thing. Then. Yeah. Make one like it. Use it like you think it might be used. See how it goes. Maybe you try it and you're like, man, this, this doesn't really work the way I thought it would. Maybe I'm right about what it is, but maybe not, because it doesn't seem to work very well. Good. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, any other ideas outside of the garden? Yeah. Um, I know, like, back then they had, you know, like, a lot of survival tools, so maybe this was for, like, meat when you were cooking things. I don't know. Okay. Okay, looks like it might be a meat hammer. What could you, or a meat tenderizer? What could you do to see if maybe you're right? Yeah, we could do the thing we've mentioned, right? We can make another one of these and try to use it and see how it works. Can you think of something else we might look for or ask to find out if we're right or to at least find out if there's support that we're right? Yeah, we said that, like use it and see how it works, yeah. Okay, compare it to similar items. That's a huge thing that archaeologists do. Uh, find out who has found similar things and then see what they have found out. Yeah. Find out what time period it's from and what other tools are at that time. Good. See how old it is. See what other tools have already been, uh, maybe not proven, but at least suggested that were used. That's a good idea. If this was used to prepare food, to prepare meat, is there a chance that there could be some like remnants of that meat on the tool? Okay, where would you probably look for it? Yeah, on the tines, on the business end, right? This thing that seems like what you would use to hit the meat. Yeah. Sure, we have some gaps here. Maybe there could be some animal bits left in there. It's kind of gross. But maybe we could find some blood, some DNA, some kind of remnants of things that are in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to tell on the image. It looks like these are spacers made out of wood uh, just to keep these things evenly spaced from each other. Um, but yeah, it does look like something's stuck in it. Yeah. Maybe it's used to cut wheat like, uh, in uh -huh. the fields. Yeah, this could be maybe a, a harvesting device, right? Something to get the wheat. Similar to looking for remnants of animal matter, you could look for, you know, wheat fodder, little pieces of the stem of wheat or... Uh, maybe even the seeds that have gotten stuck in there. That would help you find some support for how this is used. This looks like something you wouldn't want to be hit with, right? So that might lead people to wonder, you know, maybe this thing is a weapon. Similar to looking for remnants of animals if you thought it was used in the kitchen, you might look for remnants of humans if you thought it was used as a weapon, right? Maybe there's some little bits of soldiers still stuck in there. Um, or some indications that this hit some armor or sword or something like that. If you're looking for what is left on this tool, it can give you some good support, but it can also lead to questions. Let's jump back to, uh, let's, let's imagine we find some animal bits. So we, we do some testing on the tines, on the metal parts up here, and we find some, let's say some bovine DNA, DNA from a cow. That could mean that this thing was used in a kitchen to prepare meat to eat, but it could also be used as a hunting tool, right? 
doesn't seem like a very humane one, but uh, what might we look for to find out which one of those is correct? Whether it was used in the kitchen or out in the field hunting. What might be left there that would show you the difference? Yeah, Simon. It's not a very, it doesn't look very long. I mean, it looks like maybe a half a foot long and then it's just like a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't seem like you would like swing it. So it would have to be a throwing tool. So you might want to like Sure, that's great. So you're going to use some logic. You're going to think to yourself, would I want to hunt something with this tool? Um, and like Simon says, it doesn't look very big. It doesn't look like it has much reach. So you're either going to have to get really close to something, which might be very hard to do or very dangerous, or you're going to have to chuck it. So you could try to see how well it's thrown and how much damage it might do. That's a really good idea for how to find out whether you're right or not. Yeah. Okay. So there could be like little feathers in there. Sure. Or like some fur. Yeah. Because that's what you don't have like when you're in the kitchen. So maybe... That's a really good distinction. So whether it's chickens or cows or whatever, if you're finding feathers, if you're finding hair, if you're finding things like that, then that would make you lean towards hunting. But if you're not finding any of those and you're only finding blood, then that might lead you to think this was used in the kitchen after those things were cleaned off. Yeah. Okay. On the top, you can see that it's more gray and then on the little spikes, it's orange. Okay, that's a good thing to notice. And maybe that would lead you to think, you know, different, excuse me, materials are on different parts of this tool or in different amounts. Yeah. Um, it's probably a, a potato cutter. A potato cutter? That'd be sweet. Potato right, just boom, instant fries. That'd be sweet. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you guys guess what this is. This is a meat tenderizer. It is a weird meat tenderizer. It's a really old one. Um, but that is what it was used for. But all of the ideas that you guys came up with and all of your ideas for how to test your idea. Those are all valid and they're all good. And those are all really important for an archaeologist because archaeologists don't pull things out of the ground and know what they are. They pull things out of the ground and then start asking questions. What, what could like this be? What might it be? And sometimes they have a really good idea right away. You know, if you find a sword, you're like, hey, this is a sword. I know what swords are. But some things you find and you might not even know what it is. Another thing that makes the work of an archaeologist hard is that it's pretty rare that you find a thing that's still intact. You're usually finding broken parts of stuff, not entire things. So it's really important to not jump to conclusions and to always keep asking questions about what you found, okay? I think we got one more picture. Ooh, we got two, and I don't want to skip either one, and we're almost out of time, but that's fine. So you guys probably won't add anything to your notes today, but this is a, a rare find of what's called a bog mummy. So... Sometimes people try to preserve their dead, probably most famously the Egyptians with their mummification process. But sometimes nature can preserve uh, even better. So this is what's called a bog mummy. Some civilizations have found out how, or had found out how this worked and did it on purpose. Other times nature just does it on its own by chance. So if an animal or a human dies in the right kind of bog, which think of like a swamp, but dirtier, that's what a bog is. Um, if they happen to die there, or if the civilization they live in knows how this works and you're placed in there after you die, um, this little infographic is showing you what's, what's happening. The density of the water and the soil above you is gonna keep constant pressure on top of you. And the water is so high in acid that oxygen can't hang out there, which means bacteria can't hang out there, which means nothing is digesting you, nothing's eating you up. So after hundreds and thousands of years, you can still be fully intact like this person is. Um, you can see his clothes. You can see his hat really clearly. You can see his skin, his wrinkles, his mustache, even though he's been dead for hundreds of years. You can also see what probably killed him because the rope around his neck is still there. Ew, 
gross, right? So sometimes, and this is rare, sometimes you find something that's fully intact and tells you a lot of the story right off the bat. But most of the time, you're going to spend uh, a lot of energy trying to ask questions and answer questions to find out what something is or what happened to it. Yeah? How come he's all silk, like silver? I don't know the, the exact reason for the process, but um, I'm imagining that a lot of things are going to escape from the body after that much time. Um, and this is the condition that your skin and flesh turns into after that much time. But as far as the specifics, I, I don't know. Yeah? How did the shirt preserve them after they are found? This, uh, I am imagining, again, this is just a guess. I'm guessing that he's been put into a case that has then been, uh, the air's been removed, so he's like in a vacuum, which wouldn't, I don't think, stop it completely, but would slow it down enough to be able to house him in a museum. Um, but again, that's me just guessing. I, I don't know for sure exactly where this guy is and how they keep him, keep him fresh, but that would be my guess, that he's like in a vacuum. Um, all right. One more picture we won't have time for, but show it to you anyway. Um, on Monday, I'll be asking you guys for ideas of what you think this thing is, okay? And let me double check my time. We are out, so it's time to head to seventh period. You guys can put those notes in your folder or you can put them in the bin. Up to you. I know what that is.